Propaganda was, was in its very, very much in its formative stages of development. It was the concept of a government appealing to a mass audience um, was, was, was a completely new uh, phenomenon. Certainly at the beginning of the war, there was a, it was a bit amateurish, uh, a bit piecemeal, and it was particularly so in the, uh, the early recruitment campaigns and things like that. It wasn't. It wasn't entirely successful. It did rely on on the inherent patriotism of the British public. What they did in the end was get people who knew what they were talking about, and these were people like newspaper proprietors, like Lord Northcliffe and Lord Beaverbrook, who their 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 papers, like the Daily Mail, such like the Daily Express, uh, uh, were used to communicating with a, a, a mass audience, basically. So. Whereas the British propaganda effort had, had begun the war with, uh, by employing civil servants, politicians, um, they eventually, uh, the penny dropped and they, they began to employ the people who, the professionals, shall we say, the people who knew what they were talking about. I mean, countries like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and other countries in the empire, there was a, a real sort of belief in the empire in, in Britain as you know, as, as, a, as a nation, as, as a society, as a kind of figurehead. Um, and they were, you know, they were mo- motivated out of a sense of loyalty. And the, the war was also being presented as, as a conflict, a fight for basic freedoms and, uh, and the threat of, of militarism and despotism that was, that, that was Germany, basically. So there was, there was a sense that, that there, was, there was certain... Beliefs, ideals, hard-won freedoms were were, were at stake, um, and not just you know not just in in Europe, but across the world. This this was felt that, that there was a, a real threat to internationally to 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 uh, to freedom and and, uh, and democracy and things like that. So they, so they joined up because of that. So there was you know there was a sense of loyalty to to the crown to the empire, but also. There was this feeling that, that there were certain, you know, freedoms that were at stake. Conscription was introduced at the end of 1915, the beginning of 1916, basically because the war had, had, had continued uh, for much longer than anyone had anticipated. A lot of people had thought that this was, this was going to be a quite a short war. Um, what was predicted by, by some of the, uh, some of the, the leaders in, in, in Britain, chiefly uh, Lord Kitchener, who was... Uh, who was charged of raising a, a mass army was was that uh, we needed to have a big army, a big standing army, um, like France and like Germany, in order to uh, to contribute and to prevail in this war. Basically, Britain was always con- was always had always considered itself as essentially a naval power, and uh, and for that reason, it, it had always kept a small, highly professional, regular army, which was used mainly to um, settle um, colonial and then um, disputes and things like that. So it wasn't anything like the size it needed to be um, in order to engage a, a major a major power like Germany. So they um, initially there was a call for call for voluntary enlistment, which was enthusiastically taken up by the the British male population, but. As the war wore on and horrendous sort of losses that were being endured by Britain and the other countries, the flow of uh, volunteers began to, to tail off, basically, and, and conscription was introduced, basically, to maintain Britain's um, mass army, basically, so it could effectively uh, wage war against uh, Germany and the, and the Central Powers. This poster just announces the Military Service Act in 1916, which introduced conscription. I mean, there's no visual appeal about this poster. There's no exciting images. There's no appeals to masculinity. There's no appeal to avenge uh, sinking liners. There's no <laughs> appeals to um, avenge atrocities committed by the Germans in in um, Belgium. It's telling you about a new bit of legislation, a new law which says everyone within a certain age bracket will now be compelled to join the, the British war effort, i.e. The, the army. And it just basically sets out the facts uh, of this legislation and when it comes into force. So we've got Thursday, March the 2nd, 1916. In, in Australia and, and places like uh, Canada and, and things, 
they were very um, reluctant to introduce conscription. They didn't like the idea that uh, they were compelled to fight. So um, the countries that did introduce it, like Canada, did, did introduce it very late on in the war, and some never did at all. It seemed to go against, you know, the notion of, of, of you know, freedom of choice and... So, um, yeah, it was, it was uh, very unpopular, remained uh, unpopular right throughout, throughout the war, and uh, particularly during elections and at the end of the war and things, that, that the ending of conscription was, was considered a vote winner, basically, that it was so unpopular that it, it was considered as, as something that would win votes and uh, would be popular amongst the population.